Chris Brown, Thad Brown with you here on One Bills Live. But joining us now, senior producer from NFL Films. He joins us around this time every Friday during the regular season. It is Greg Cosell joining us to talk NFL draft. We're just over a month away, Greg. Are you going to have enough time to cram film on 300 some odd people? Well, first, I'm going to have to change my name to Brown just to do this segment. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> uh, we got but, enough Browns. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting a little worn out. You know, I, I'm still working seven days a week trying to grind through guys. And, you know, it's like when I go to the bookstore. I love to go to the bookstore and I just get aggravated because there's a thousand books I'll never read. And I feel like there's, you know, 200 players I'm not going to get to see. And I'll probably still get to see 200. But there'll be 200 more that will just aggravate me that I won't get to see their tape. But. Hey, I'm only a one-man scouting service, you know? <laughs> Greg, before we, we move on to the draft, l- l- go over some of the guys that the Bills grabbed in free agency. I think the number yeah. one player, obviously, is Von Miller. You know, and, and the, he's been a Hall of Famer. I mean, they probably got a gold jacket made for him already right this second. Going into his age 33 season, the question is, can he continue to do it as he gets older and gets on the back nine of his career there's nothing I've seen on film that says otherwise. What's your take on that? I would agree. And it just shows you where the NFL game is now. And and the Bills know that. And there are many ways the forefront of it is you have to score throwing the football with, with a great quarterback. And you've got to sack the other quarterback, you know, or, or put pressure on him. And that's what the game has become. And obviously – the Bills the last two years have lost twice in the playoffs to Patrick Mahomes. So now they've got to beat Patrick Mahomes and you have to be able to put pressure on him and make him play in a way he doesn't want to play. And they needed to increase their ability to rush the quarterback. You know, they they get close to the quarterback, but they haven't had the finisher. And I think they feel that Von Miller is the finisher and there was nothing to suggest based on his time with the Rams anyway, that he can't still do that. And my guess is he's probably pretty rejuvenated because, you know, I think a lot of players want to come to Buffalo because they feel Josh Allen gives you a chance to play in a Super Bowl. Right. And since uh, Thad asked one free agency question, I'll bounce one more off you before we get into these receivers in the draft. Um, I was telling Thad earlier that I'm kind of intrigued by all the defensive tackles that rolled in here. Daquan Jones, Tim Settle, Jordan Phillips. Um, And I think that you got a bunch of pile movers here, Greg. I mean, these are the guys that are coming off the, you want coming off the furniture moving truck when you're moving out of your house. Um, Which one do you (laughs) think maybe changes the line of scrimmage battle the most for the Bills defensively, who who do you think could have the most impact of those newcomers? I realize Jordan well, Phillips has been here before, but yeah, um, to me the the most intriguing of the trio is Tim Settle, because I think Tim Settle he came into the league he was overweight and they had to get his weight down because Tim Settle's one of those guys that actually has really light feet. He just was overweight, and I remember the year he came into the league. I believe Jim Tomsula, who's a very well-respected D-line coach, uh, was the D-line coach in Washington at the time. And I remember him telling me that this guy was really, really talented. You know, as as talented a D-tackle as he'd seen, and he'd been in, in the NFL for a long time. So to me, of the three, he's the most intriguing, just because I think he theoretically can be more than just a road grader and a run stuff. All right, Greg, let's move on to the draft. And, and one of the position groups that's gotten a lot of attention up here in Buffalo is, is the wide receiver yeah. group. And, and as always, seemingly these days, it, it looks like a very deep class. And before I, we get into any individual player, I wanted your take on receiver in general. Because of the depth that we've seen the last couple of years, you know, my philosophy on it has been you almost don't want to take the first guy because the receiver you get at 10 versus the receiver you get at pick 30 versus the receiver you get at pick 50 – are so close. I'd rather get the pick 50 guy because my value is going to be better. Now that take was wrong last year because Jamar Chase and, and the guys at the top of the draft were fantastic. But what's your opinion, Ben, on the receiver groups that have come out the last few years? Because it seems like every single year there's eight, 10, 12 guys who can really play at the next level. Yeah. And I think very often receivers are in the eye of the beholder and very often they're scheme dependent because uh, NFL coaches think in terms of scheme adaptability uh, as much as anything. So, you know, I think that you're always going to find receivers that can play. You know, someone like Jamar Chase is truly special. I'm not sure there's 
that guy in this draft. Uh, I guess we won't know that till they play in the league, but I think everybody pretty much thought Jamar Chase was going to be a special player. Um, I'm not sure everybody thought, and I'm just being honest, I'm not sure everybody thought that Justin Jefferson was going to be that guy. It's easy now after two years to say, oh, sure, that's easy. I mean, he played <laughs> almost exclusively in the slot his last year at LSU, and I think there were questions among many smart, reasonable people as to whether he was an outside receiver and he's proven to be. So, you know, sometimes that happens, uh, but there are certainly a lot of receivers in this draft. I find it difficult for, to, you know, to compare receivers. I mean, for me, it's very hard to compare, you know, a 5'11", 185 pound receiver to a 6'2", 220 pound receiver. You know, I think that, they're thought of differently by scouting departments and personnel evaluators and very often in their deployment within the context of an offense. Well, let's jump into the group here. I know you gave us some of the top names when we met with you out at the combine a couple of weeks ago, we're going to kind of mix in some of the names we didn't get to the last time. And the first one I'm going to throw at you is Jamison Williams, the Alabama receiver who unfortunately had an ACL tear in the national title game, non-contact injury. And yeah. I've heard doctors say, and look, I'm not a doctor and I'm not going to pretend to be, but those kinds of orthopedic surgeons have said the non-contact ones are usually straight, no frills repairs, which tend to lead to faster recoveries. Now, every case is different, but I think that's certainly the hope if you're, a, if you're an NFL team that's interested in this guy. Well, there are not many receivers, Chris, with his flat-out vertical speed and big playability, and that makes him an impact receiver and a game-changer. And every coach wants a game-changer. You know, when I was at the Combine, uh, in talking to offensive coaches, the number one thing they now talk about, you know, years ago they'd say, well, you got to establish the run, you know, all that stuff. Now they say we need explosive plays. And Jamison Williams can give you explosive plays. Right. Um, I mean, he has that natural quickness and explosiveness. Uh, it's It just jumps off the film. Um, he lined up both inside and outside. So, you know, let's assume health. He will get healthy. Um, now guys do come back from ACL tears, they, and they do play. So he's got accelerating deep speed. He can get on top of and run away from corners. He did that consistently in college. My guess is he'll do that in the NFL as well. So, you know, he's, he's going – I can't say where he's going to get drafted, but the, that kind of receiver is always in high demand. Do, do you think receivers in high demand? Go ahead, Chris. Real, real quick, Thad. I just wanted to do a follow up on that. Do you think that he is better suited inside because of his very narrow frame? I mean, Devontae Smith, you know, a former Alabama guy, has sure. proven to be a productive guy outside despite a thin frame. How does his thin frame impact where he might fit best, do you think? Just think of it this way, Chris. He's 20 pounds heavier than Devontae Smith, yeah. which is remarkable. I don't think that's a factor. I think okay. the way teams move receivers around now, put guys in motion. You know, he's obviously a guy you would love to use in motion because you'd love to get him free access where he can really accelerate with that speed right off the snap. Um, but I don't think that's a big factor. I think with very few exceptions, do coaches think, oh, he's only a slot. He's only an outside guy. Okay. I think the game has changed, and there's just been an advancement in, in offensive thinking. Another skill set that is, has been in demand, it seems, lately in the NFL is the ability to separate. And I think uh, Sky Moore, a guy who I guess is projected early second round from Western Michigan, is a guy who has those traits. I mean, exceptionally quick, great burst. The big question that I would have with him is that this is a smaller guy who played in the MAC, not at a Power Five school? Right, right. Is there a concern with him? I guess size-wise, being able to, you know, get off press coverage and and being able to function in the NFL, where you know you're going to get bigger, faster guys every single week of the year. Yeah. Now he's under five ten. Now he's compact. He's got a a compact frame, and he he was physically and competitively tough. I mean, that's one thing that really stood out watching his tape. He ran a ton of slant routes, a ton of glance routes. Um, he did play on the outside a lot at Western Michigan, of course, a lesser conference. Um, in fact, 43 of his 95 catches this past year came when he was aligned outside at number one. I don't know if he'd play outside that often in the NFL. Um, my guess is he'd play more snaps inside 
but the physical competitiveness, the toughness, um, you know, I think that he's got, he's got quickness to him. I kept going back and forth on him as to whether I thought he was truly sudden or, or just quick. And there's a difference. Um, but I think that he, he will probably play more of his snaps in the NFL inside. That would be my guess. Uh, another guy that came off a major injury and came back in time to help Georgia win a national championship uh, was George Pickens. Uh, I mean, six three and a quarter, one ninety five. So not huge, but tall. Um, ran a four four seven, Greg. And I know that you know people down at Georgia have told me that he's clocked as low as four four prior to right. the injury. Uh, do you think they take that time with a grain of salt because he's less than a year removed from the knee injury? Um, well, first of all, I love George Pickens' tape. I loved him. I watched his tape from his first season in 2019 when he was really good. And, he, you know, as a young player in the SEC, I watched all his 2020 targets. I personally believe if he was not injured, he'd be a top 12 pick. I think George Pickens is a really high-level prospect. Um, and he fits the the – absolute profile of a boundary X receiver. He's explosive both off the ball and into his route stem. He eats up space in a hurry. He's got stride length because he's 6'3". He's got build-up speed. He ran by SEC corners. He's got really good ball skills. He makes tough contested catches. Um, he has a wide catching radius because he's big. I think George Pickens has it all. And, you know, I, th I think it also says a lot about him, Chris, that he came back to play. He did right. not need to do that, you know, because he, I'm sure he knew he was coming out. He did not need to come back to play in those final two, three games. And he made a couple of big catches, uh, both in the SEC championship game, which they obviously lost. And he also made a very big catch in the national championship game. So I think that says, I don't know George Pickens, but I think it says something about him. And I think he's really, really a strong prospect. Maybe the biggest enigma wide receiver wise in the first round might be USC's Drake London. I've seen him projected top 10. I've seen him projected out of the first round and, and he's got all the, the size and, and certainly the contested catch ability. Didn't run a 40 at the combine says he's going to do it at the pro day. You know, I, I know that your you know, your role and your job is based on watching film. How much are you interested in that 40 time at the pro day? And then where do you land on Drake London in general? Um, I go back and forth on Drake London. Um, you know, I think that he's he's got certain traits. He's smooth. He's savvy. He's got an excellent feel for creating space. Uh, he finds voids in zone. Um, there's no question he has great body control, really good hands. He can go above the rim and make catches. Um, he can do all that exceptionally well. But there's no real juice to him at all. There's no twitch. There's no suddenness to his movement. He's an upright runner. He's a little tight and stiff as, as a route runner. So there's some positives and there's some negatives. Um, I'm not real good with saying where guys should be drafted, but I did not come away watching his tape feeling as if he was a top 10 or top 12 pick in a draft. Now, I almost came away watch, from watching his tape, guys, thinking he might be better off playing inside. And the player I thought of when I finished watching Drake London was Marcus Colston. Um, and, mm. you know, I, I, I'm never certain, and maybe I'll be wrong on this. And if I, hey, I hope he makes it. I, I have no horse in the race, but I'm never certain exactly how to deal with guys whose MO is contested catches, particularly in a conference that does not have a lot of good corners. So I'm not exactly sure. Is that a good thing? Yeah, I mean, obviously, he's got really good hands, great body control, and he can go above the rim. Um, and that's really good. But it, can you make a living in the NFL making contested catches on the outside? I've seen people I respect, we all respect, compare him to Mike Evans and Mike Williams. I must be honest, I don't see that at all. I don't think he has that kind of juice at all. What about Michael Pittman? Would you compare him to that, or is even that a stretch? Well, Michael Pittman's a bigger man, and I thought Michael Pittman was a better prospect, but yeah. that's me. And okay, Pittman I was, was just curious. I was yeah, just curious because I've heard Pittman some people do that, and I don't know if that's because of the USC thing or whatever, but yeah. in any event, I found, I found that interesting. Um, small school guy, Jalen Tolbert, South Alabama, ah. uh, six one and an eighth, 
194. He's got 10 inch hands, Greg. 10 inch hands for a receiver and ran, let's see, high four fours, I think, at the combine. So why don't you give us your thumbnail sketch uh, on whether well, this kid's got a shot, you know, making a jump from South Alabama to the pros? I watched him last summer and, and his 2020 tape, and I immediately contacted Jim Nagy because he's from South Alabama, which is in right. Mobile, yep. you know, which is where Jim is. And I said to him, I said, Jim, I, I hadn't heard about this guy, but I just watched his tape and he's going to play in the league. And Jim said, oh, yeah, he's going to play in the league. So, uh, of course, then I watched all his tape from this year as well. Um you know, he's he's a finesse receiver. He's smooth. He's fluid. Um, he'll probably be seen as an outside receiver. Doesn't mean he can't play in the slot. Um, he's got that kind of size lane, three-level uh, profile that's um, probably best maximized when he's free off the line of scrimmage, when he can use that length. Um, he looks taller than his 6'1 and a quarter on tape, but that's what he measured. He's 6'1 and a quarter, I, I believe. Something right around there. Um, yeah. He's got build-up speed. He's got acceleration. So that kind of translates to some explosiveness feel to his game. Um, I would say he's got more long acceleration than short area separation quickness. But he's he has the look and movement of an NFL wideout. I noticed that immediately last summer. And my guess is he'll probably be a, a day two pick and he'll play in the league for sure. Greg, I know the Bills picking at 25 might limit their options, but if you were able to take one receiver and, and drop it onto this Buffalo Bills team in terms of fit, and you talk about how important scheme fit can be, is there a guy that stands out as, wow, this guy would be perfect in this Buffalo offense? Well, I'm assuming that the offense will be similar. Obviously, they have a new coordinator. I can't imagine because of Josh's comfort clear comfort with what they were doing that Ken Dorsey will make meaningful changes. There'll probably be some tweaks, but I doubt that the whole methodology will change. Wouldn't you guys agree with that? Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, let's look at what they have. They've got Stefan Diggs who essentially can do it all. They've got Davis who came on last year, long can run. Would you view him? I, and how do they view him? Do they view him as a vertical receiver? Do you think? As a guy that can get over the top, do they see him that way? I don't think so. I, I think he's a guy maybe a little more in the digs mold that can do a lot of different things. Vertical is one of them, but not I wouldn't say not his number one trait. Not exclusive. Yeah, I would love to see them get a vertical receiver then. I you know, I mean, I would love to see them get a guy that can run. Um, you know, then it all depends on on size, you know, how they feel about size. Because I love Jahan Dotson from Penn State. He's one of my favorite receivers in this draft. Um, I have no idea, you know, as I said, where guys get drafted. I mean, if Jamison Williams was there, I, I think, you know, he's a guy, he can take the top off the defense. So I, I think given that Josh can make any throw and and you to me, you want that vertical guy, I would love to see them get a guy that can change the way defenses have to play and can take the top off the defense. Greg, last one for you. Um, obviously, the Chiefs, yes, they got Marquez Valdez-Scantling to kind of make up for the trade loss of Tyreek Hill. But sitting there with pick 29 and 30, um, the general consensus is one of those is going to be used <laughs> on a receiver. Uh, they love draft and speed, but it, it's going to be interesting to see what they choose to do and whether they feel they can find a receiver they can incorporate right into the offense immediately. The general consensus, though, Greg, is that you can get a starting caliber receiver as late as round four. Would you tend to agree with that, with the number of ones you've you've looked over so far? Sure. You know, starting caliber is a relative term, Chris. Yeah. I mean, you know, clearly, if you're drafting a receiver in round four, you don't believe he's, quote, unquote, the guy. But depending on who else you have on your team and how you run your offense, you certainly can get a receiver that you can put out there for 40 snaps. I mean, is let me ask you this. I know he's not there anymore, but is Cole Beasley, was he a starting caliber receiver for the Bills? The answer would probably be yes, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and how many snaps a game, game did he play? So when you're in 11 personnel now, which teams tend to be, it depends on the team, obviously, but at least 55% of the snaps, I think your three receivers are starting receivers for the most right. part. 
So sure, can you get one of those guys in round four? Absolutely. You know, it just depends on how you see, just like we spoke about the Bills. What do Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott feel about the kind of receiver they want to go with Stephon Diggs and Davis? You know, what kind of receiver are they looking for? Are they looking for the Jamison Williams type? Would they love a guy who's 6'3", 215? You know, they're not going to come out and say, here's exactly what we're looking for. But they, they know this, you know, in their meetings. Now, if there's someone they love, and maybe it doesn't fit exactly who they want in terms of body type and speed, they may take that guy because they love the player. But most teams try to fit it into how they see the, their entire offense. They don't. And unless the guy's transcendent, and when you get, there's no transcendent guy in this draft as we speak now. All right, Greg. Well, thanks very much for the time. As always, we will catch up with you here as we slowly make our way closer and closer to the I'm 2022. I'm trying to watch corners, Chris. NFL. I know you guys need corners, so yeah, I'm we need to corners. Watch corners yeah. you know? I mean, I, I hate to give take you a, time to watch. I hate to give you a to do list, but you know, I, I yeah, know you I know, got one of your own. But time to watch because you got to watch games. You yeah, can't I know, I know. Plays the corners. You got to watch pain. games. So yeah, there are no so I'm grinding away here. You know. Yeah, there are no shortcuts with corners for sure. No, there are, are none. Uh, th- thanks very much, Greg. We'll catch up with you soon. All right, guys. Appreciate it.